If you haven't seen her yet. She's the president of Cub Concerned United Parent, Birth Parents, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. Birth Parents, excuse me. Come on up, Lee. That was an interesting slip. Brilliant. Yeah, because we were talking about that at dinner the other night, and we were talking about being second stage, what we call family advocates. We're Almost like second stage feminists or second stage family advocates who are thinking about why do we need these qualifiers, you know, birth parents, <laughs> adoptive parents, why do we need to qualify who we are? Hi, Marty. <laughs> it is so good to be here and to connect with all of you people. How many are Cub members? Oh, it's so neat. <laughs> it is so good to see your faces. And it's a pleasure to meet new people. Um, and it's really neat that it's happening in March in sunny California. <laughs> I left New Hampshire on Wednesday. It was four degrees. <laughs> I talked to my family on Thursday. They were having a snowstorm that lasted all day Thursday into Friday, 16 inches. So it's really neat to be here, and I'm so glad it's March, and I'm so glad it's sunny California. <laughs> <laughs> um, last um, fall, Mary Jo asked me to come and speak, and she asked me to pick a title of something so that they could begin to frame this, uh, this conference and my part in it. And, uh, geez, I had 46 things on my mind. You know, if I picked this really esoteric thing, <laughs> and then I've been laboring this week, why did I pick that subject for? I have to somehow make it make sense. But uh, <laughs> if it makes sense or not, we'll just play around with it. I picked learning about the three R's, review, react, and reform. Yes, it, this really wasn't meant to be, I don't think, because Mary Jo just went in one ear out the other, and in her initial mailing, she put it at the three P's. And oh. P's and Q's, you know, we're trying to then make it work, you know, what three P's could you work with? <laughs> but anyway, it's supposed to be the three R's, re review, react, and reform, and it's something we all do in our personal lives, in our professional lives, and in our organizational lives, whether we know it or not. Um, maybe by talking about um, using as microcosms Cubs work, uh, my professional work, my personal life, it will bring it from the hinterlands, this process that we're using Review, React, Reform, and then we can uh, put it to greater use in our decision making. Um, just as one example, when, when we review and react and reform, we're not very good cognizant on annual reports. It's supposed to be done annually, but and we'll get better, but we really haven't. But our first annual report really covered five years. <laughs> <laughs> and the first side is the poster, Cub 1976 to 1981. And on the back of it is in small typewritten form, the work, and we weren't really keeping very good records, it's just what we were able to collapse and gather from here and there during our first five years. So you can see in small typeset form that we really did a lot of work, especially since this is just a small part of what we did do. That's prop number one. Prop number two is this. We are now doing our second annual report, which, as I said, we're getting better. This covers two years. And that's not keeping very good records. We ask our leaders to send us an activity report every four months, every three months. And a lot of the leaders don't send us activity reports. But when they do, we keep them, and then eventually they come out in the format like that. So there's an awful lot of work that's being done out there that we aren't able to really prove to you is being done. But you can see that there's an awful lot. Um, I'm not going to give a written speech today because I get married to my written speeches and, I, and I'm like this because I love words and I write in two ways. I write haphazardly when I've got you know lots of different things to do and then I write laboriously when I really want to say something 
And when I say something, you know, each sentence can have like 15 adjectives and, you know, three words. And, you know, they're really power packed. And I get so married to it. I really want to share with like what I've got in my toes and what I've got in my heart and what I've got in the core of me. And, and I just read so that not one adjective gets lost and not one word gets lost. But then I don't connect with you. And I don't want that to happen. So I probably won't uh, speak with as many adjectives and verbs today, but we'll get along just fine. Uh, yesterday, I just went through my cards, and it came to 50 minutes, which is you know five minutes more than I'm supposed to speak. And I had only gotten like three quarters of the way through. Um, and I'm talking even more now in introduction than I did yesterday. So I'm probably not going to get through my whole thing, but they do have me busy today. They do have me in two workshops, and there's going to be a time to chat afterwards. So maybe we can embellish um, some of this stuff. I also really want to be informal. Informal is very key here today, and I would have come dressed in a jogging shirt or something, but um, Butch told Mary Jo she should got the president, she should come dressed, and she hurt her foot, so she couldn't, so I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we were talking about words, and words are really, really important. <coughs> to me, they are. I think they define us, and they help us to clarify our own feelings and how we feel about each other. Um, I'm a professional shrink of sorts. I have a master's degree in counseling, and I was writing to a company one day with an adopted woman who also is a shrink of sorts. And we were saying, and we were talking about all our issues, and we were saying, isn't it wonderful that we finally have a language? We finally have words that expresses how we feel so we can we can really explore it. And she's she's so right. You know, in 1976 when Cub first got started, we were like cave persons, you know, a grunt here, a grunt there, and uh, <laughs> you know, trying to just figure out what was, what was happening to us, what was going on inside of us, and how we could express this to others, and brainstorm with others, and, and hone in on it. And then we gauged our reactions to grunts, you know, we thought about, you know, being concerned United Natural Parents, and then we gauged that reaction, and we realized that that would be offensive to some adoptive parents who then say, well, that makes us feel unnatural, and we wanted to respect where they, they were, and so we came up with birth parents, and by then, um, Annette Barron and Ruben Pannon and Officer Rowski's book was out, The Adoption Triangle, and they used birth parent, but as two words, and we experimented with that, and that didn't feel, it was closer, because it dignified the birth process, and that's our connection to our kids, and we thought that was very good, but we wanted something even better. We didn't want to be cub, you know, so <laughs> we, we experimented, and we, went, and we thought, concerning United birth parents, birth parents, one word. Boy, that felt good. Because we were like grandparents, progenitors, and nothing could take our progenitorship away from us. Not signing a thousand piece, pieces of paper could take away what God and what destiny had made us to our children, which is birth parents and that connection. And um, as we did that, we were reforming the language of the larger world. And we began to see birth parents, one word, appear here and there, and began to feel uh, really good about it. Um, but back then, uh, you know, without a name, birth parents were called everything in the book, and in some were pretty dirty books. Um, and even by ourselves, when I first started to awaken, which was 10 years after the surrender of my child, I wasn't in touch with any other birth parents, and I needed to be. Uh, I needed to know if I was alone with my awakening. And uh, the Boston Globe has a section in the women's pages called Confidential Chat, and everybody writes in about recipes and how to take care of your kid who's uh, hyperactive or whatever. So I wrote a letter to the Confidential Chat and signed myself, Biological mom. <laughs> I rip my tongue out now before referring to myself as biological mom. That's reducing me to procreating protoplasm. <laughs> I'm a person. I'm a woman. I'm a mother. And but then I signed it biological mom. Um, we went to the. I was appointed by then Secretary of HEW Joseph Califano to sit on a model adoption panel that met in Washington between 78 and, 70 and 80 to formulate model adoption laws for the country. And we sat on that panel, and for the first year and a half, there was no problem. Everybody in all the texts that we wrote up every day, the word birth parent was placed there. 
six months before the termination of our duties, um, two persons came into the meeting, two of these experts came into the meeting, and one was Betsy Cole of the Child um, Welfare League, and one was Lori Flynn of the North American Council on Adoptable Children. I think we need to be accountable for what we say or do, so I would say who they are. Um, they came into the meeting and they said, I think we should no longer refer to um, these people as birth parents, but we should instead refer to them as biological parents. And I was stunned. It didn't matter what my preferred self-referencing term was. And I had chosen not natural parent because I wanted to be sensitive to them, but that sensitive sensitivity was not reciprocal, it wasn't reciprocated. And you know what I did? I went into the ladies room and cried. I just didn't know what to do with it. I just cried. Sam is just as human as you are. I cried. And I went back out there and uh, Elaine Schwartz, who was um, a staff member of HEW, came up to me afterwards and she said, why don't you use natural parent? And I told her. But time went on and I didn't feel that I had any advocates. And on our last day, Elaine Schwartz advised the panel that she, as a staff member, had to write a report on the panel and their interaction and how it all worked out. And she said she was going to say some really good things about the panel, except that they wouldn't be sensitive to the word birth parent. And she gave them the option of changing it back to birth parent or to have her write that up in her report. And we changed it back to birth parent. And then more time went on and we just heard birth parents, saw birth parent everywhere. But something really weird is happening out there in society as we do our review process in terms of the birth connection. And this really honed in uh, for me when I was after the Cabbage Patch Kid mania erupted. Oh, that wiped me out. You know, I was on the phone all the time with reporters and whatnot. And one uh, talk show host, radio talk show host, called me and set me up to do a live interview on his radio show. And um, during our preliminary conversation, he indicated that he was an adopted child. I mean, he didn't sound like a child to me. He sounded like a very grown up person and I you know I suggested that you know perhaps he was an adopted man and he said well I'll always be mommy's little boy that should have told me something <laughs> but I did the show anyway because education at all costs must go on right one must put aside and um, and hope to educate and so forth so we were doing the show and he said on air well you know why do you want to be called birth parent and I went into why I wanted to be called birth parent and he said well, that's all well and good, but I'm going to call you biological parent anyway. And I was shocked. And then a, another, he opened it up to callers, and a woman called in, and she said uh, she was an adopted child too, and that um, she agreed with him that I should be called biological. And I said, and it doesn't matter to you that that's my preferred self-referencing term. It doesn't matter to you that I find biological offensive. It doesn't matter to you that if I were black, I would find that as offensive as calling me nigger. That doesn't matter. No, she said. And in my shock, I continued the show, and I hung up, and I shivered. I was so angry. I just sat in my office and shivered. So I reviewed, I, I gauged that reaction and I talked to other cub leaders and I decided at what point does one set aside education and do what's right for you? I mean would Martin Luther King sit through a radio show while they were calling him nigger? I mean what does one do? And I decided that I would give my spiel the next time and I would say why I wanted to be called birth parent and I would say that I understood that biological parent might be their conditioning, might be what they grew up with but that the next time, they, now that they knew and they called me biological parent, that the conversation was not going to be productive and I would take the next caller. And if the host was of the same frame of mind, then I would just simply have to discontinue the conversation and hang up. Because at some point, we have to be true to us. You know, at some point when you educate, you educate, you educate, and it doesn't get any place, you have to do what's really right for you. You know, talking some, some more about words, and I was indicating before we were talking about being second stage uh, family advocates and reviewing what we had reviewed before and reevaluating what we had um, bought in before. And you know, Bonnie was saying that she would prefer just to be mother and without birth mother, and I'm sure that adoptive parents prefer to be called 
um, mothers and fathers without the preface of, uh, of adopted. Um, I don't really have a problem with being um, a birth mother, but I can respect to, you know, that the mother is, is fine. Um, but as a second stage family advocate, I'm sort of reconsidering the use of the word adoptee. I think I might be alone in this, but let me just bounce it out here. I think it happened for me when I took a look at the title of Katrina Maxton Graham's new book, um, An Adopted Woman. That felt good to me inside because adoptee, as I think about it again, is like lessee, lessor, you know, where's the person in there? Amen. You know? And I never really thought about it before, but it felt really good. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of nods here. It's good to be adopted woman, adopted man, and speaking generically, adopted person. Isn't it? And I thought, well, I'm glad to see I might not be alone in that. But that's some of the things that I'm, you know, I'm reassessing as we as we move along. You know, talking about the weird stuff that's happening with the birth connection and there's um, an increase in cesareans. There's an increase in scheduled inductions. You know, the doctor will say, well, I have to go on vacation in two weeks and you're due in, uh, you know, in three, so why don't you come on in and we'll induce you. And there's, there seems to be a need to take control of the birth process, which is only going to work against us, those who are connected only by the birth process, I think, when they start to negate the importance and the naturalness of the birth process. And I think that this really showed up, as I think about it, in terms of the Cabbage Patch Kid. Here is, a, here is a, they've segregated a population of people to be born to cabbages. You know, again, negating the, the birth thing. The persistent use of bio by Betsy Cole, who certainly knows better, who has been advised by our organization and with whom I've spent a great deal of time talking about this. She says, that birth of uh, father doesn't work for her because fathers don't give birth. You know, and I've talked with birth fathers and they say, but they are connected to the birth parent and they don't, into the birthing experience, it's increasingly even. And they don't want to be procreating protoplasm, you know, in bio parent, which is even much more harsher than, than biological even. But she insists, and she's a friend to the movement, she insists on bio parent. And, and biological parents, this, this Cleveland radio show, you know, how they insisted on doing that. I don't know what the answers are. I'm just offering this as, you know, something for us to review together and to gauge our reactions to it and, and how we can uh, reform this. Um, there's also a wider, wider something that's happening out there in society. It's always happened, but it's really annoying and befuddling to me. And that is the failure of society to see the Stepford wifery of the inmates of the Edna Gladney home, for example. Yeah. You know what I mean by Stepford Wifery? Remember that book in that movie that came out, Stepford Wife? And these were these women who, I don't remember, some chemical or whatever, something in the water or something, but it rendered them zombie-like so that they wouldn't go to deeper levels of themselves and wouldn't reach beyond going down grocery aisles and taking canned goods and putting them into their cart and paying for them and going home and cooking and taking care of the kids. They were like zombies, and that seems to be what's happening at the at the Gladney home. You look at Barbara Landry. Have you heard about Barbara Landry? No. Oh, Barbara Landry is a young woman who was pregnant, lived in the Bronx, uh, was afraid to tell her parents that Edna Gladney is very well healed, has toll-free number in every major phone book in the United States, and she called the Edna Gladney home, and they said, well, listen, you don't have to tell your parents. You just get on a plane and we'll pay for it. You come down here and we'll teach you computer training and all you have to do is give us your kid. That's all you have to do. You don't have to deal with anything. You don't have to deal with your reality. You don't have to deal with what's happening to you. Stepford Wifery starting. She gets on a plane. She goes down to Texas. They put her on this wonderful pastoral-like grounds with a swimming pool and and uh, different apartment houses and this different wifery. And she went through the road and she delivered her baby and uh, all while not telling her parents that mail was being forwarded to Florida where her parents were told she was and was being picked up and dropped off and forwarded in, in that fashion. Some of us know what that's like. Um, and then she delivered her baby and then she called her parents and they said, why did you tell us, come home? 
And it was the fourth day, and Edna Gladney doesn't let you see your baby until it's the day of signing. So they, it was the day of signing, it was the fourth day, and she's sort of waking up, but not fully there. And uh, she, they, she held her baby, and she started to really cry. And then they took her baby, and they gave her the papers, and she signed. And she cried, and she went back to her room, she cried for 24 hours, couldn't stop crying. She went back to them and said, this is really wrong for me, I'm awake now, I really want my baby, I can handle it, I can deal with reality, I can deal with what's happening. And when they found that out, in, in Texas, I guess, you can revoke until uh, the filing of the interlocutory degree. So they rushed down to the courthouse and filed the interlocutory degree, knowing that this is a woman who was wavering. And they, and they uh, filed it, and then they said, there's nothing that you can do because it is filed and the child is in the, first, in the adoptive home. And that's that. And you know what she's doing? She is staying there. She will not leave until they give her back her baby. She's staying there. This great woman staying there. They have got an eviction notice on her. You know? And I'm so proud of our people in Texas. They're out there with their placards and they're marching back and forth in front of the stepwifery home. You know, birth parents care forever. Edna Gladney is big brother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All this kind of thing. I'm just so proud of them. But nobody out there in the large of the world sees this. Edna Gladney says in the great big light spread in Life magazine in November or December, you know, two huge blown up pages of pregnant women holding teddy bears. Now you know these pregnant women didn't walk around every day of their lives in their pregnancy holding onto the foot of a teddy bear. You know that the, the photographer said, okay girls, strut around and here's a teddy bear to hold. Nobody sees that. And of course the caption was, children bearing children. You know? So that's how they used, that's how they used these women. But the larger world doesn't see that. <coughs> yeah, so we're reviewing all this and say, how do you wake up the larger world? The, some of the laws that are coming down, our legislators are putting this in, they're putting it, spending our tax dollars, they're putting this in tax. There's a new bill that just came to my attention. Uh, a a cop member called me and said, have you heard about this? It's a bill introduced in the U.S. legislator, H.R. 5093. It's to amend AFDC payments, and what they want to do is to stop all AFDC payments to unmarried, always unmarried, always unsomething, always lacking something. Why not single? Uh-uh. Got to be unmarried. They want to stop all AFDC payments to unmarried minors who are not living in their families in their parents' home. Do you know how many kids still get kicked out of their home when they're pregnant? And then they go to an agency and now they can't get AFDC? Now this hasn't passed. If you remember the number 5093, you might want to write to your U.S. legislator and tell them, cut out this nonsense. And it's a press to adoption. They say um, that there is an exception that if such individual has lived apart from his family for a year before the birth of the baby, so in order to get help, you would have to know, uh-huh, I think in three months' time I'll go and get myself pregnant. So if I'm going to get any help, I better leave my family now. So what they're saying is, or the second part of that exception, is that if the child is a year old, if the child is a year old, then they'll give you some care. So what they're doing is they're pressing all these newborns, they're funneling all these newborns into adoption. It's hard to believe enough. Do you feel disbelief? Do you not believe this? Or do you feel this is the way it should be? No. Or it is happening. It is indeed happening. Um, the renewal of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act has language in there which says um, Health and Human Services shall provide pregnancy counseling services particularly to unmarried parents which present adoption as a positive alternative. 
not as an alternative, not exploring the pros and cons, but as a positive alternative. Now, can you imagine any other family separation language passing Congress? Can you imagine someone, our legislators, saying in here, um, let's have language which says that all marital counseling centers need to present divorce as a positive alternative. <laughs> all um, family counseling centers need to present family feud and severance as a positive alternative. But people in the larger world aren't seeing these things. This language was based upon something that our friends, the National Committee for Adoption, uh, brought to legislators' attention. It was a study that they brought to the legislators' attention. It was a study by Dr. Christine Backrack, in which she compared the characteristics of, quote, never married mothers to adoptive mothers. And in it, she says, the data reveals a sharp contrast between privileged economic circumstances of adopted children and the extremely disadvantaged economic status of children with never married mothers. Adopted children also appear advantaged with respect to the presence of a father in the household and the educational attainment of their mothers. Never mind that this is elitist. Never mind that this might say if you want to stretch the fantasy that all of us should give our kids to the king and queen of England because they have more money. You know, we should all go out and try to find someone who is richer and better educated. I have a master's, I should find someone who has a doctorate, you know, to raise my children. Never mind that this is elitist. It's also incorrect. I got this study. I looked at this study. They were comparing never married mom mothers between the ages of 15 and 24 with adoptive mothers who were in their 40s. <laughs> but do you think the legislators would think to look at that? <coughs> we have our work cut out for us. Okay, one of the ways that come... Let's see, where's my notes here? I lost all my notes. They are gone. Excuse me, will we uh, be able to ask questions later? No. <laughs> I'm probably at the end of my time, too, am I? Good. <laughs> but I'm just getting warmed up. Uh, one of the ways that Cub is doing this, and during the workshops or later on, you know, maybe informally we can discuss some of this, especially in the next workshop that I'm going to do the slideshow and birth time where there's going to be a discussion period. But one of the ways that Cub, and again it's a microcosm because we're all doing something. You wrote down the number 5093, you're interacting in a group, you're doing your bit. But just using Cub as a microcosm. Um, we, we haven't put out a 16 page monthly newsletter called The Communicator. And every month we have legislative reports. And we bring this to the attention of our 1,500 paid cub members. And we ask, write about this. Write to your US legislator. Write to your state legislator. That's one thing that we're doing is to alerting them, hey, there's another side to this. Look deeper into this study by Christine Backrack. Look deeper into the issues. Look deeper into the birth connection. Value that. Um, we also have an outreach to agencies. Okay, the Adolescent Family Life Act mandates that grantees, that is people who receive money under the Adolescent Family Life Act, must promote. I mean, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act is not alone. Prior to that, and already enacted, is the Adolescent Family Life Act. And anybody who receives money under the Adolescent Family Life Act is mandated to encourage adoption as a positive alternative. They can't talk about abortion. That's forbidden. They can't refer about abortion. And they're cutting back. Reagan is cutting back. Family support systems win. It's been cut back. Food stamps has been cut back. The press is on. You can see that they're honing in the channel. You know, they're widening the channel for adoption. So we're writing to these pregnancy counseling centers, and we're not. We're educating those who are recipients of these funds and saying, "Listen, look at what they're asking you to do." We're doing that. I'll reach to agencies. We call it. Uh, to the legislators, we're we're putting up a post. We're going to do a poster. Not unlike this poster. We've got this all in drafting stages at this point. It's going to be a pregnant woman, very pregnant woman. And it's going to say, who cares about keeping this family together? We want to begin to show the world that a pregnant woman and her unborn baby are a family. They deserve the same support systems as though the child were born. They are a family. They will always be a family. They may be a blended family by adoption if adoption takes place. 
but they will, in my view, in my experience, always have that connection, always being extended. They'll be in a periphery, maybe. They'll be fantasy, maybe. They'll be in the shadows, maybe. But they're always a part of that. And on the back of that, because regrettably, and you hate to do this, but <coughs> regrettably, the sense is out there that adoption is better than being raised in your birth family. This is true. That's the, that's the sense that's out there. That otherwise, they would look deeper than all this. They think that it is better. It may be better in some circumstances, but it isn't necessarily better. There's no guarantee that adoption is going to be better. Jim Gritter, uh, with a Traverse in Traverse City, used a wonderful analogy once with me, and he said, "There you have a birth parent whose star has fallen. She's." shocked at her pregnancy maybe, she's very vulnerable, doesn't ha perhaps have a lot of dough, is perhaps not completed her education, her star has not yet risen. And here on the other hand you have a prospective adoptive couple whose star has risen. They have completed their education maybe, they have perhaps a little bit more money, but that doesn't mean that these adopted parents star isn't going to fall and the, and the birth family star isn't going to rise, or they aren't someday going to be equal. And so on the back of this poster, over time, Cub has received lots of news clippings um, that <coughs> just shows the, not necessarily negative in the larger context of things, but you know, bad things befall, unfortunate things befall adoptive families in the same way that they befall birth families. Adopted parents abuse their kids in the same way that birth families abuse their kids. It's, and what we're trying to do is to have a leveler here. And on the back of this is going to be the star rising, star falling bit, and then a collection of all these newspaper articles of adopted parents who have abused their kids. Blah, 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 blah. You know, not because we want to do that, but there needs to be a leveler out there. There needs to be an introduction of reality out there. So that when a decision is made, one doesn't say, ah, here's the guarantee my child is going to be better off. And the social worker can all, no longer say, I will give you a guarantee that your child is going to be better off. How many of us have searched and found our kids in circumstances that are, and you hate to use qualifiers and better than, but lesser than. You know, economically, I, I see some hands go up. And it feels like a ripoff. At least know up front that there's going to be an adoption, there's going to be family separation. At least have it based on facts and not on some unreal presentation of, of fantasy. We are going to include this poster in a survey to U.S. legislators. We're going to really say what the issues are, real clearly, say what the issues are and uh, ask them how, what, their, what their sentiments are about the issues. We're going to give them a poster. Going to take back what they say. We're going to distribute it. We're going to have our members right. We're going to educate, educate, educate like crazy. That's what we're reviewing and our reaction and our reforming is coming in. We also, uh, since we began our work in 1976, have provided some form of service to perhaps about 45,000 people. In the beginning of our work, you know, we, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, I used to bake bread. You know, I would wash the floor until it shone. You know, that's where I was in my head. What did I know about running an organization? Um, so in the beginning, we weren't necessarily doing all the things that we should have been doing. We weren't taking down names and addresses of everybody who was writing. Um, but towards the end, as time went on, we realized, oh, there might be some value in taking down the names and addresses of everybody who was writing. So now we have 30,000 names and addresses of people who have written to us, joined us, didn't renew, potential friends. Their spirit is with us, their heart is with us. And what we're going to do is computerize those 30,000 names, and then we're going to send them out legislative alerts. We're going to try to organize so that we can better educate. That's one of the things that CUP is doing. Another thing that, we, that we're doing is we feel that it's easy for them to blatantly separate families because uh, on the one hand, they aren't aware that, that adoption is as human as, as being raised in birth. I mean, it has its ups and its downs. But they also don't know what they're doing, for example, to birth parents. And so in August of 1980, we put a questionnaire in our monthly newsletter asking birth parents how they had fared post-surrender. 
What had this meant in their lives to have a child who was missing in adoption? How did this impact upon their subsequent marriage, the subsequent parenting, the subsequent reproduction? Um, it's taken two years to analyze all the data, to write it all up, and I am so excited because it was accepted for publication and will be in the April issue, this month's issue of the American Journal of Orthopsychiatry. This is the prestigious publication for professionals. And that it has been accepted there. You know, I always think this is the thing that's going to do it. That's the thing that's going to do it. And I keep trying. It's really, I'm not deluding myself to thinking this is the thing that's really going to wake everybody up. It's going to, you know, the pillar is so strong and so deeply entrenched in the ground that it's going to take lots of whittlings away. But I nevertheless feel that this is going to be a powerful tool. A little bit about the research. We had 334 respondents. 321 were birth parents, were birth mothers, and 13 were birth fathers. 69% reported that their surrender occurred to what they called external pressure. That is, number one was pressure from agencies and professionals. Pressure number two was from their families. Pressure number three was lack of financial support. 85% of our respondents had their adoptions arranged through an agency. We took this data and we explored four areas. Search, marital interaction, parenting, and subsequent reproduction. In our survey, 96% had thought of searching. That's thought, thinking about it. I might like to do this sometime. 65% had ha actually started to search. When we took a look at the factors that might play in here, two significant factors emerged. One was external pressure. Those who felt that they had been externally pressured to surrender their child for adoption were much more likely to search than those who cited, I didn't feel ready to perform a parenting role at that time. So that was definitely a factor. And social workers might be interested in taking a look at that. You know, if they want to prevent search, then they want to make sure that the person who is deciding on adoption is indeed deciding, making an informed choice that is coming from inside here and not from outside there. Uh, and another, the other interesting factor was the time since surrender. We're learning so much, it's so exciting um, to look back and see all that we've learned. The time since surrender, most searches began after the child was 12. There was almost nothing between the, in the first eight years. But then 8 to 12, there was an increase. 12 to 18, an even stronger increase. And over 18, very, very high. And what this says to me is that this lends credence to my emerging theory, and I think now solidified, that birth parents suffer from the PTSD syndrome, which is a cute way of saying post-traumatic stress disorder. You're perhaps more familiar with this than the Vietnam Vet Syndrome. They go off to war, they perform an unnatural act, they kill people. They come back, they block it out, this didn't happen, this is not part of my life experience, I can't deal with this. Eight years later they start to wake up and the horror of the war comes back on them just as though it had happened the day before, just as though they were in it. You know, you've heard stories of Vietnam vets on cliffs over highways doing people in. They're there. They're there back in the war. And this is what happens a lot of times with birth parents. You perform an unnatural act. You sever yourself from your child. You don't know what's happening to your child. Your child is missing in adoption. Just like the MIAs. You don't know if that child is alive or dead. It means you're not foster care happily adopted. You don't know. You block it all out, you know, eight years, 10 years, 12 years later, for me it was 10, right in the middle, wake up. You're right there. For me, I felt the surrender just as powerful to the pregnancy. I almost felt pregnant. It was so powerful for me. And I think that this birth parents, I think we now have identified that birth parents, I think this is part of the proof suffer something that is analogous with PTSD. Now this is not to say that all birth parents suffer PTSD. I think that many birth parents say that they never forget, but they don't act 
for 8, 10, 12 years later. And it's like they remember on one level and then they begin, you know, to act out. We took a look at marital interaction. 71% of our respondents said that their marriages had been severely colored by being a birth parent. 17% of our respondents were birth parents who had married the other birth parent of their, of their child. These marriages were especially colored. Their marriages were either held together you know, by this child, in some of these cases, or their marriages were you know, a love-hate relationship. Oh no, I only have five minutes, you tell me. Um, and those who also cited extreme um, marital, marital coloring were those who had higher educational levels. <coughs> but surprisingly, birth parents did not divorce at the same rate as the general population. They stay in these marriages even though they're unhappy, and this might have something to do with self-punishing. You know, I deserve this, or this is a man who married me in spite of, I'm tainted, and I can't, I can't go out, or uh, this is way of punishing. I know birth parents, in my own, uh, that I know personally, who will stay in an abusive marriage because they feel that's what they deserve. So birth parents, as a rule, do not divorce at the same rate as the rest of the population. We took a look at parenting. 80% cited that parenting, their subsequent parenting, um, having a child missing adoption had a powerful impact on their subsequent parenting. They are very overprotective as a rule. I was, I was different from this. I was in the beginning, I think while I was beginning, I was underprotective. I was almost, I could have been abusive if I wasn't wrapped so tight. I was so afraid to love my kids, you know, to give into that, for fear they'd be taken away. I had to keep, you know, a reserve for me to protect me. But others really get into their kids. They overprotect them. They love them to death. They're compulsive worried. They can't go stay overnight at grandma's house because, well, just because. I don't know why, but they can't say they have to stay with me at all times, 24 hours a day, come with them on my sight. They have a real issue, is, in generally speaking, in letting go and letting their kids be independent. Yet, um, the kids were a primary source of emotional gratification. They use words like, my children's birth was like a sacrament to me. They use words like, they're so precious, valuable, irreplace irreplaceable. Cobb is taking a look at another part of, um, oh, I don't want to get into that just yet. The fourth thing, and I think the most interesting thing, is the subsequent reproduction. 38% of our respondents never had another child. 38% of our respondents. And I think, I really do think, that this has nothing to do with just our self-selected cub group. I really think that this is across the board. 16.2% were unable, despite many attempts, I mean, many, some of these made a conscious decision not to have another child. It would be too painful to have another child. I wasn't worthy to raise the first one, therefore I'm not going to be worthy to raise the second one. I don't want to be unfaithful to my first one. I want to keep that alive. I don't want it to color it, negate it, uh, shadow it in any way. But some of them tried like hell to get pregnant again and weren't able to. The, the number of people who tried like hell to get pregnant and weren't able to means that birth parents run a 60% greater risk of secondary infertility, 60% greater risk of secondary infertility, infertility than the general population. Only 6% of the general population can have one child and then never get another one. Birth parents run a six. So look at the catch-22 that they're setting up. Separate families and then add to the population of infertile people who need more families to be separated so that they can then become parents. You see the catch-22? Um, we, we compared lots of things as why, what might be happening, what factor might be operating here which would impede subsequent reproduction. Not one thing, one thing appeared significant. However, I know personally a lot of birth parents who were unable to conceive. And amazingly, when they found their kid, when they reunited, pregnant. One birth parent went through a lot of marital, a lot of um, fertility testing, and it was discovered that she was secreting a hormone that impeded her ovulation. So it may be that the stress of having a child missing an adoption releases a hormone, and I'm not a doctor, 
that impedes subsequent reproduction. Something to think about. We are we are going ahead with another research. You know, they always say, well, we can't have reunions because the adopted family is going to split up and it's going to ruin everybody's life and, you know, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so we're doing another research. We're designing it right now. We've got the birth parent questionnaire pretty well designed. We're working in the adoptee questionnaire and the adoptive parent questionnaire. And we're going to take a look at post-reunion relationships and hopefully publish that in the American Journal of Orthopedic Psychiatry if they'll have us again. And there's so much more to say, but I know I'm, I know I'm there, right? I'm there, and I, the end. This is where it has to be. I hate to cut off right here, but maybe we can talk again, here and there, and informally. And thank you very much for having me. It's good to see you all.